perfect timing. I'm out here in the apiary at the farm checking on some of our little friends, the honeybees, and they are really looking good and they have been so busy lately, you just cannot believe it. You see, beekeeping or apiculture dates back several thousand years, but humans have been collecting honey for much longer than that. Early rock paintings actually indicate that harvesting honey from wild bee colonies is one of the most ancient human activities. So after all these years, why is beekeeping still so popular? Well, come on, let me show you. My name is Steve Schroeder, and I first got interested in bees about 10 years ago. We've been keeping bees in Arkansas since we got here about six and a half years ago. More than anything else, bees are an interesting, technical, scientific uh, topic to learn, and there's a lot to study and a lot of skills to get. So the idea of skill building and uh, intellectual exercise to me is what attracted to bees because I didn't know anything about them. Aside from that, the bees are important to pollinate the crops on my farm, mostly our fruit trees uh, and our vegetables. Um, in addition, the bees are interesting as all get out just to study and watch. Our bee yard varies from eight to about 12 colonies. Uh, and a colony may have one hive box or two hive boxes or three hive boxes. Uh, usually depending on what time of year it is. I think the first steps for someone who's interested in beekeeping is to find another beekeeper nearby who will help you. Beekeepers are friendly uh, and very eager to help new beekeepers and uh, show new beekeepers the ropes. I think it's also important uh, that any beginning beekeeper take a formal beekeeping class and these are usually offered by the County Extension Service or frequently by beekeeping clubs throughout the United States. If you're interested in keeping bees, what I suggest is that you check and see if there is an association in your state, figure out when they're doing bee classes. Sign up for one and get some honey bees. It's easy enough to build. I think of this, these are two by sixes. Ready to build your own hive? Learn how right after this break. Steve, I really love this setup, and the stand that you've come up with is excellent because it'll allow me to add more hives across here over time. It does. Uh, it's simply made from dimension lumber, and we put pipe with just floor flanges on the top and the bottom. Right. It's easy enough to build. I think of this, these are two by sixes, and I like to build them about 12 feet long, and then the distance from the front to the back is sized to match the bottom of the hive bottom. And it allows you to move the hive down a little bit if you want to, sure, move it back sure. and forth. Yeah. And that's convenient when you're changing the number of hives that you're gonna have on this hive And for stand. a first time hive keeper, you know, the idea of keeping it at a good height because it makes it so much more convenient and easy on your back if you have it at the right height. Now let's talk about the hives themselves because All right. um, often we see hives that are painted white and here we just have a natural wood but it has a finish on it. Honeybee hives are painted white simply by custom and because white paint is cheaper yep. and it also reflects light and keeps it a little cooler a little in the cooler, hive. Yeah, yeah. We wanted our hives to look more like furniture. So we found a product that will protect the wood that is stained uh, to this particular color, which we call honeybee gold. Mm, and it's, sim <laughs> it's simply applied to this uh, pine. This is uh, mostly a Western pine that these are made out of. And the components start at the bottom with the bottom board and then continue up to the super. This is called a deep super or a brood box. Right. It's where the bees live in the winter time. It's really their home. This is a hive top feeder. Mm -hmm. And we're feeding bees now because we're in the middle of a drought. Alan, do you want to lift that off? Yep. Underneath the cover is what's called the inner cover. And this is simply a screened cover. You can take this off. Ah, oh, look at all that nice sugar water. 
<laughs> so that one's taking a swim. Because we're in a drought, and because these are young colonies still uh, producing brood and having to pull comb, we want to make sure that the bees are adequately fed. So this feeder sits on top of the colony, and the bees crawl up a channel in the middle, and then down the screen to find the, the nectar substitute, which is just sugar water. Mm -hmm. They find that, and then they take that back down into the hive, and they use it to produce honey or use it to feed young bees, sure. whatever they need it Convert for. Convert it into honey. So Steve, why don't we lift the feeder off and just take a look inside the hive. Some help with that. Oh, there. And this is a, still a fairly small colony. This colony, is a little more advanced. I'm gonna pull it out very slowly. Wow, look at all that brood. And what we're looking here is what every beekeeper wants to see. This is brood, and each one of those little round brown dots is a cell on the comb that has a baby bee in it. Mm -hmm. And the queen lays an egg in the bottom of that cell, and then the other bees feed that egg, and it hatches and becomes a larva, and then it pupates into a bee, and choose its way out. Uh, so we're optimistic about this colony. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Coming up after the break, attracting pollinators to your vegetable garden and why they're so crucial to have among us. So you prepped your soil, and you planted your garden, and you're watering it consistently. But how do you make sure that your plants will produce all those delicious veggies you want? Well, that's where the bees and other pollinators come in. They're not as crucial with root vegetables or leafy greens, but most other vegetables like squash, cucumbers, and melon need to be pollinated in order to produce the stuff we eat. Basically, bees travel from flower to flower collecting nectar. And in the process, pollen from the flower's anther, or male part, sticks to their bodies. The bees carry the pollen to the pistil, or the female part, which develops into the vegetables you harvest at the end of the season. Without pollinators, you'll just have a bunch of flowers and no veggies. So to increase the chances of your plants being pollinated, there are a few things you can do. First, plant flowers, like zinnias or bee balm, near your vegetable garden to attract bees and other pollinators. Second, avoid using pesticides, especially dusts. You see, these are toxic to bees and other pollinating insects. Lastly, you know, you can pollinate your plants by hand. This can be done by using a paintbrush or a cotton swab to transfer pollen from the male part to the female part of the plant. In some cases, these are found on the same flower, and in others, like zucchini, they're on two separate flowers. So you've put your bees to work. Now what? After the break, we're having a harvest party. Stay tuned. I have to tell you, I'm so pleased with the performance of my honeybees this year. You cannot believe how much produce we've taken out of the garden, in large part due to them. They're great pollinators when they're going around looking for that nectar. But we're about to do something very exciting, and that's the honey harvest. And now we're going to enjoy the sweetest fruits of their labor. Come on and join me. Charles, I appreciate all your help getting the bees ready for the harvest this year. Well, it's really been a trying year, but I think we finally got to the point that we're ready to harvest the honey and really enjoy the fruits of our labor. From early, early spring, like March until now, they've been storing honey in those supers, and each one of them you think maybe has about 50 pounds of honey in them? Probably about 50 pounds of honey. They're really pretty heavy. The honey is particularly dense, surprisingly yeah. so. Each of those probably has 40 to 60,000 bees in it, even this late in the year. So each of those boxes may have 5,000 bees, and we certainly <laughs> don't want to take that inside. <laughs> no, we don't. So what we'll be doing is taking one off, and we'll be trying to shake some of the bees out. We'll be using smoke to try to encourage some of the bees to leave. And then we'll actually be using blowers and brushes to try to remove every single bee 
off of each frame so that when we take them inside, we don't bring the bees with us. I've been to a few honey harvesting parties where the bees figured out where we'd taken the honey and that wasn't much fun. No, it's really not. Once one or two bees find it, they go to the hive and tell them there, and you literally can have <laughs> five, 10,000 bees who join your harvest. They want to show up for the party. That's absolutely. <laughs> All right, well, why don't we get to work? Let's go. Honey madness. That looks good. It's well capped and ready to go. Wow, look at that. Nice full frame. You can tell that these have lots of bees in them. The next step is going to be to get those bees out. <laughs> and that means they're going to be out here. Because we want the honey and not the bees. <laughs> That's so good. So how much honey have you had so far? You know, a little honey goes a long way. I'm probably at my limit now. Oh, already? <laughs> well, I mean, we're underway. Look at that gorgeous honeycomb in the jars. And we've really got some pretty comb honey that's still capped. And we'll probably spend most of the rest of the uh, time uncapping the honey to get it ready for the centrifuge. Well, you know, that, the capping is so important because that's what releases the honey and takes it out of the little cells. And you know, Charles, I've always used a knife like that, but we've got a new device this year, which is, what do you think of it? You know, I've only used it a few times. This is a planer and it gets hot and it's actually a little heavier. It's a little easier on the wrist and often in a single pass, you can completely uncap the frame of honey. Yeah, and you know, I think it's really smart to have these trays around because you're capturing every single drop. Yes. Or trying to at least. We do, and, and we'll, we'll recycle all of that honey. It'll all go into buckets. Of course, the next stage is once you've taken the cap off, it's put it in the centrifuge and sling it out. Put it in the centrifuge, and the way we'll process it, each piece has to go through three times, but it'll basically sling all of the honey into the side where we can drain it out and have it ready for filtering and bottling. So once it comes out of the centrifuge, I mean, it's, it's essentially ready to bottle, isn't it? Well, not quite, because these frames have come directly out of the hive. There are other bees in there. There are parts of these. Filter a little. There's pollen, bits of other material. And so we want to filter that uh, through two passes of filtration, and then we'll get it pure enough that we can bottle it. And that is a jar of brand new honey. After the break, an easy slow cooker recipe you won't want to miss. It's so good. Stay with us. I don't know about you, but I love the flavor of honey in just about every possible situation. But I want to share a recipe with you that I've come to really enjoy over the years. It's called honey pork with apples, and you prepare it in a slow cooker, and nothing could be easier or tastier. It's a great way to put to use the golden richness of honey. This recipe has very few ingredients, but they all come together in a wonderful way. We're gonna start with the apples, and I'm using four to five Granny Smith apples. I gauge the number of apples based on the size of the, the pork loin that I'm cooking. This one happens to be uh, almost five pounds, so I'm using five apples, so one apple per pound of pork. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take half of these, and I'm going to line the bottom of my slow cooker with them. I'm just gonna fill it in like this. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to take half of my honey and I'm gonna pour that over the apples, as you can see here. And once I have the honey distributed evenly across the apples, I'm gonna add uh, one of our spices, in this case it's cinnamon. What I have here is two tablespoons of ground cinnamon. I'm just gonna use half of that. 
just gonna sprinkle that over the apples like this. What we're creating is a bed for the pork to rest on, okay? So now it's time to take the pork, and what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take and cut some slices across the pork like this at an angle. And I'm not cutting very deeply, only about, you know, half an inch, three quarters of an inch, at the same angle all the way across the top. And slide these apples in. Some of them can kind of overlap a little bit, as you can see, like this. Makes a really interesting design. I'm just gonna move right across like this. Now I'm gonna gently raise up a piece of pork and place it here on the bed of apples, honey, and cinnamon. Doesn't that look great? Okay, now the next thing. I wanna add some onions. I just love onions. This is a whole medium-sized yellow onion. What I'm gonna do is just sprinkle a little bit of onion here on the top and sides. And I'm gonna just throw in those extra apples as well because I don't like to waste anything. There we go. So now we're going to add the last of the spices. And so here's the, the remaining half of that cinnamon. I'm just gonna cover this, the remaining part of the cinnamon. That'd be about one tablespoon. And then I wanna add a teaspoon of ground ginger. I'm making sure that I evenly distribute this across. And then one teaspoon of ground nutmeg. And what is the final ingredient? You guessed it, the rest of the honey. So we're gonna drizzle this honey over the top, just like this. Now all I have to do is put the lid on, put it on low, and let it cook for eight hours. It's a sort of recipe that you can do in the morning before you go off to work, come home, and you've got a delicious meal. You cannot believe how flavorful and tender this dish is. It's perfect for having a group over. So give it a try. Want to learn more? Visit pallensmith.com for delicious recipes, garden tips, blog posts, and for our online store. Stop by and stay a while. We'll be back right after a short break. Honeybees are truly amazing. I mean, just think about how they pollinate all these plants and bring such yield to our gardens. I can't imagine my garden without them. And this time of year, when the harvest comes in, it's a sweet little deal, particularly when you can share it with all of your friends and, of course, get them to help you with all the work. For Garden Style, I'm Alan Smith. Inside, you can see the queen. Yep. She's got a little blue dot on her back. Yep, there she is. This is a fertilized queen that a uh, queen breeder produced. And there's some white that you can see here, and that's sugar candy. And that she's going to eat her way out, and the other bees are going to eat their way in. The bees in this colony will recognize this queen as their own, and they will have had a week or so to get used to her smell. Right, she's releasing her pheromones, and they're adopting her.